Good afternoon. My name is Bob Lowy, Chair of the Baltimore Jewish Council's Holocaust Remembrance Commission. On behalf of the Commission, I am pleased to welcome you here today for this virtual Yom HaShoah Holocaust Remembrance Day commemoration. While we are disappointed to be distanced from each other for a third year in a row, we are continuously grateful that we can come together online to memorialize the six million Jewish lives and millions of others lost senselessly during the Holocaust. Please allow me to digress for a brief moment. A few months ago, our committee lost its co-chair, Rachel Glazer. I am honored to carry forth her vision and determination in Holocaust education and remembrance. Later on in our program, we will pay tribute to Rachel. Zecher Tzadik Livracha, may the memory of the righteous be for a blessing. 2022 marks the 80th anniversary of the meeting of the villa on Lake Wannsee within a suburb of Berlin, where 15 high-ranking officials gathered to decide and ultimately agree on the fate of European Jewelry. Within the 90-minute span of this meeting, the final solution of the Jewish question was created. That solution was the mass murder of the 11 million Jews remaining in Europe in 1942. They used words like evacuation, reduction, and treatment. Today, I stand here a descendant of survivors of the Shoah to remind the world that the Nazis' final solution failed. Although I'm an only child, I have two sons and four grandsons to further reinforce this failed attempt. Each and every year, we as a community all over the world have the obligation to carry on the memory of the six million Jews murdered at the hands of the Nazis and their allies. As the New York Times wrote, the anniversary of that fateful meeting has a special resonance at a time when survivors of the Holocaust are dwindling and anti-Semitism and ideology of white supremacy are resurgent in Europe and the United States. The opinion shared by many is that Wannsee Protocol is the only document in history codifying genocide as official state policy, also noting that it did not take place in some backward country, but in one of the world's most technological and scientifically advanced societies of the time. Our program today is made possible because of the ongoing generosity of community sponsors, including the Glick and Liebman families, who through the David and Rose Glick Yom HaShoah Endowment Fund have supported the Yom HaShoah program since 1986. We're also grateful to the David and Regina Weinberg Foundation, a supporting foundation of the Associated, and the Associated Jewish Community Federation of Baltimore for their support. The support and dedication of these families and organizations to Holocaust remembrance will help our community ensure never again. We also thank our partners at Chizikamuna Congregation and the Jewish Museum of Maryland for their partnership in this commemoration. I am Rabbi Andrew Bush, President of the Baltimore Jewish Council. Frustrating as it may be to commemorate Yom HaShoah at a distance and knowing that we look forward to future in-person gatherings, it is important and meaningful to mark this day in Jewish history, the impact on our people and others, and the lives that were lost or forever altered by the Shoah. I am particularly moved this Yom HaShoah as this winter's attack of Ukraine by Russia happens on territory and in a society that was linked to the history of World War II. A decade ago, I stood at Baban Yar and more deeply understood the impact of the Shoah on the Jewish citizens of Ukraine. For those who have visited the site of that massacre, you know how moving it can be to be there. Our hearts have been open to the Ukrainian people this year in a way that most of our ancestors could have never imagined. Babanyar even returned to the news in the midst of the current conflict. A 
A few years ago, I visited the house in Vansi that we will hear about today. It is a chilling experience to walk through the rooms, to ponder those who sat there in 1942. The historical explanations are disturbing. Being present in that tranquil atmosphere is truly unsettling. Thank you for joining us in marking Yom HaShoah and in learning about this important history. I'm Beth Goldsmith, Chair of the Board of the Associated, and I'm so proud to be with you today, even if we can't be together in person. This year's Yom HaShoah commemoration seems to be unlike any we have faced in decades. As we watch the horrors out of Ukraine, the similarities to our own pain from 80 years ago are much too real. Our mantra of never again is being echoed again, and as we watch the events unfold across the seas, this war is having a triggering effect on Holocaust survivors, victims of Nazi persecution, and Jews across the world. The Associated Network is responding as best we can on the ground in Ukraine and bordering countries, assisting refugees abroad, and preparing to welcome refugees to Baltimore. I know many of you are feeling the emotional effects of this war within your own memories, and our Associated Network is here to help you through these difficult times. Please reach out if you need our support. I also want to acknowledge that we are fighting another growing battle, the prevalence of anti-Semitic rhetoric and hate speech targeting Jews and other ethnicities and minorities. Through the efforts of the Associated and Baltimore Jewish Council, we're fighting anti-Semitism and working in our own community when incidents occur and we're calling on all like-minded organizations to join us in this battle for love over hate. We're continuing our efforts to fight for better Holocaust education in our schools and universities, and we are calling on legislators, public officials, and school administrators to address the hate speech with tougher laws and more transparency. Throughout the program today, we remember the Wansi Conference and the evil that hate and discrimination can do. By watching this program, by learning from our survivors and victims, and simply by being together, we are demonstrating our commitment to never again. During these difficult times, your associated network stands tall and continues to work and fight for justice on behalf of our Baltimore Jewish community. On behalf of the associated, thank you for your support and continued dedication to our efforts. Hi, I'm Senator Ben Cardin, a proud member of the Baltimore Jewish community and a member of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum Council. Each year, Yom HaShoah serves as an opportunity to join the global community in remembering the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. We have a responsibility to remember the names and lives of victims and to memorialize them to ensure that we never forget the true costs of apathy and hate in our communities. It is a time to recommit ourselves to and uphold our pledge never again with solemn resolve and perpetuity. We cannot let the passage of time weaken our commitment to this promise to preserve freedom, equality, and basic human rights for all people. Wherever there is a lack of moral leadership, we must fill the breach, stand even stronger in our convictions, and unequivocally denounce anti-Semitism, racism, sexism, and bigotry wherever they occur. This year, the phrase, never again, takes on deeper meaning as we've witnessed in real time the horrors inflicted upon civilians in Ukraine by the Russian military. Before World War II, there were over 1.5 million Jews living in Ukraine. Only about 200,000 remain today. Never did the world imagine such brutal attacks against civilian targets would be repeated. The United States will continue to stand and support the people of Ukraine, who have fought hard to defend their sovereignty from invaders. We have sent defensive weapons and humanitarian aid while sanctioning Russia to the point of international isolation. The late Elie Wiesel reminded us that we must always take action in the face of injustice. He said, neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim, and that silence encourages the tormentor, 
never the tormented. Let me close by thanking the Baltimore Jewish Council for this annual commemoration. Yom HaShoah serves as a cautionary reminder to the Jewish people and all people. We have a moral obligation to take action and to take a stand against atrocities wherever they arise. From the ashes of the Holocaust, let's build a more just, peaceful, and compassionate world. May their memories be a blessing, and may we act as a community to make it so. Good afternoon. My name is Shoshi Pondak, and I am here on behalf of the Pondak Greenblatt families to present the 2022 Pondak Greenblatt Families Award for Excellence in Holocaust Education. Each year, this award is given in memory of Morris and Anna Greenblatt and Frida Ponzak, all survivors of the Holocaust. This award is given to local educators who go above and beyond to bring dynamic Holocaust education into their classrooms. This year, it is my honor to present the award to Crofton Middle School in Anne Arundel County. Crofton's eighth grade English classes participated in an extensive Holocaust unit this past year while ba balancing the rest of their required curriculums in the midst of online schooling. This comprehensive unit included meeting with educators from the Jewish Museum of Maryland eight times to learn about the Shoah and then create their own virtual Holocaust memorial featuring videos, PowerPoints, podcasts, and more created by students on subjects pertaining to the Holocaust. It is my honor to welcome Crofton Middle School into the Ponzac Greenblatt Family's Honor Roll of Schools. Sarah Ripian, an eighth grade language arts teacher from Crofton Middle School, is here to accept the award on behalf of the school. My name is Sarah Ripian. I'm the language arts department chair at Crofton Middle School, and I accept the Ponzac Greenblatt Award on behalf of the eighth grade language arts students and teachers from 2020-2021 for the project we completed. We are honored to accept this award and eager to continue the tradition of teaching and learning empathy and compassion through Holocaust education in our school community. The Diary of Anne Frank is included in our eighth grade curriculum. Last year, during the most unusual of learning circumstances, we decided that we needed to do things differently to reach our students at home while we tackled this challenging history. We refused to miss out on using the text as an opportunity for life lessons, empathy creating, and connecting to history. We partnered with the Jewish Museum of Maryland to host sessions of the Holocaust Memory Project. Marissa, the museum educator, shared stories using survivor collages along with lessons of compassion and empathy to our 400 eighth grade students and countless staff members. Our students came prepared with questions and built connections between the stories Marissa shared, our text, and their lives. It was important to put names and faces to the statistics and the facts that they've learned over the years, and students were moved to engage in their own research projects. We knew that there had to be some way to commemorate the work that they were doing and the passion they were demonstrating to preserve their projects and learning over time. With the hybrid nature of our learning that year, we decided to create a virtual memorial to share with our school community. Students were inspired to choose a project in a format that appealed to them based on a topic that resonated with them that would be included in our Crofton Middle School Virtual Holocaust Memorial. Students could choose to create a podcast, a documentary, a virtual museum exhibit related to Holocaust resistance, or a blog post about an upstander. Students conducted their research and incorporated their learning from our JMM guests to create projects to be displayed in our virtual memorial. Students created documentaries about memorials, peaceful protests, and resistors. Students created podcasts about children of the Holocaust detailing stories of bravery and hope. Students created virtual museum exhibits about liberation, Jewish resistance, youth of the Holocaust, and Anne Frank. Some students created blog posts about Leon Bass. Student projects were organized into a Google site and shared with other students, teachers, and community members. Students were so proud to share with the community to spread knowledge and most importantly, compassion. One student shared, throughout my school career, I have learned a lot about the Holocaust, but never about the real life personal stories that you shared with us today. 
I think that we all really appreciate the hard work that you do to help people learn and help people's stories live on. One of our eighth grade teachers expressed, your presentation allowed for our students to connect with this difficult material in an intensely moving and personal way. Thank you so much for the important work that you do and the testimony you bear witness to and share. I am so grateful that my students and I were able to share this memorable and meaningful experience. We are so honored and humbled to be recognized and are eagerly looking ahead to future work in Holocaust education and growing empathetic global citizens through learning history. Thank you so much. This year, our program focuses on the 90-minute meeting that determined the fate for millions of innocent men, women, and children. Just 80 years ago, 15 high-ranking German officials gathered to create and determine an implementation of state-sanctioned mass murder that extended beyond the borders of Germany and into the rest of Nazi-controlled Europe. We continue to speak about the lessons of the Shoah and fight against tyranny and oppressive rule long after the end of the Nazi regime. Saying never again means that it is our obligation to continue to push back against fascism in the world today. Last year marked the 80th anniversary of the Babin Yar massacre in Kyiv, where 33,000 Jews were killed. Earlier this year, the world watched as the Babin Yar Memorial in Kyiv was bombed during a dictator's invasion of Ukraine. The desecration of this memorial site reignited the fears of Jews around the world, who within this lifetime have seen the dangers of a fascist government. Today we will learn about the origins of the plan that was sponsored by the state to destroy the Jewish people. It is our collective duty as Jews or non-Jews to take these lessons and ensure no other government repeats this atrocity. To present on our topic, I am proud to welcome Dr. Matthias Haas. Dr. Matthias Haas is the head of the Education and Research Department and the Deputy Director of the House of the Wansay Conference Memorial Site and Education Center. He is the curator of the traveling exhibition, The Wansay Conference and the Persecution and Murder of the European Jews, which was shown in a number of cities in North America and South Africa. He has worked as a consultant, lecturer, an educator in the fields of politics of memory, European integration, and international exchange programs. Dr. Haas has worked for a number of organizations, among them UNESCO, the Federal Association for Civic Education, the Corbert Foundation, Amzayed, and Rhodes Scholar. He was the director of the United States Program of Action Reconciliation Service for Peace in Philadelphia from 2005 to 2009. He studied political science at the Free University of Berlin and specialized in the field of historical foundations of politics and the politics of memory. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Haas to the screen. Welcome everybody. Hello, um, it's an honor for me to be here with you tonight. My name is Matthias Haas and I come from the House of the Wannsee Conference, a memorials site and education center, the historic site where the Wannsee Conference was held. Our focus as an institution uh, is the history through the perpetrators and their actions. So we tell the history of the Holocaust from the event of the Wannsee Conference. And our focus in our work is education. We do many educational programs with a variety of professional groups from police and the military to nurses in training and apprentices of chemistry. And of course, we work with school classes. We also work with the modern administration with five federal ministries and raise questions about professional ethics in history, but also today. And as we all see, this is very relevant in our present world. All of our groups work on the history of their profession during National Socialism, 
and the relevance of this history for them in their field of work today. They all address the Wannsee Conference as a key event in the process of persecution and murder of the European Jews. My presentation today is about the Wannsee Conference in its larger historical context. And after an overview uh, of the meeting and some of its participants, uh, I will, in the second part, I will try to present you a new approach uh, that we at the House of the Wannsee Conference took in the last months uh, while working on uh, the events of the 80th anniversary uh, of the Wannsee Conference. Um, so let us begin with a general situation in Europe and Germany and in Germany in January 1942. On September 1st, 1939, the World War II begins and with that, not only a war for territory, but also for the racial new order of Europe. The main target of this race war were the Jews. With the invasion of the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June, 1941, the systematic murder of Jews began. Men, women, and children were murdered by the Einsatzgruppen the mobile killing squads of police and SS. And by the end of 1941, more than 600,000 people were murdered. And this is the setting where the Wannsee Conference took place. Here you see how the institution looks today. It's a beautiful villa at the lake, uh, Wannsee in the outskirts of Berlin. On January 20th, 1942, a meeting took place at Lake Wannsee in Berlin. There was only one topic on the agenda of this work meeting with breakfast afterwards, as it was called in the invitation, and which lasted around 90 minutes only. It was the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe, how to organize the deportation and murder of 11 million Jews of Europe. Reinhard Heydrich, who you see here, the head of the Rice Security Main Office invited 15 officials from the police and SS, the administration of the occupied territories in Eastern Europe, the party chancellery, and various ministries. Heydrich was authorized by a directive signed by Göring on July 31st, 1941, to carry out all material and logistical measures concerning the final solution of the Jewish question. His aim at the meeting was to highlight his leading role in the organization of the genocide, to secure the cooperation of the participants, and to make everybody aware of what final solution meant, mass murder. Heydrich's initially planned conference date, December 9th, 1941, had to be changed following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Germany declared war on the United States on December 12th. And let us look at the situation in Europe at that time. We see the European continent here in the middle, the dark blue, that's the German Reich. The light blue territories are the countries and territories occupied by Nazi Germany. We have in Lilac, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, semi-independent right-wing authoritarian regimes. And if they did not behave accordingly, they were occupied as well, as in the case of Hungary in the spring of 1944. We have fascist Italy, an ally to Nazi Germany. Yeah, the battle over Britain, it seems a matter of time until we win, we the Germans, Germany wins this war. And it seems we were conquering Europe and the Wehrmacht is in, right in front of Moscow. So the war is won. And what the, the, the participants of this meeting at Wannsee um, have on their minds is the eternal battle of races has come to an end point and we are winning. We have shown and proven we are superior, we are the master race and whatever we do is legitimized by our victory. So killing millions of innocent people, mainly targeting Jews is the way they're planning to do. The decision to murder all the Jews in Europe was probably made in this period. Historians still debate the concrete date when the decision was made, and there is no key document signed by Hitler that, that gives evidence, as we have, for example, for the euthanasia killing, the murder of people with disabilities. But we have evidence through a series 
of meetings and speeches that mid-December 1941 was probably the time when Hitler, in coordination with Himmler and others, made the decision to murder all European Jews. Now, let us have a look at who was at this meeting. And if we look at these men, we don't have the first row of leading Nazis. We don't have the politicians here. We have what we call in Germany, Staatssekretäre, the permanent secretaries of the different agencies. They are the, the heads of the administration and know how to run a modern uh, ministry, a police department, um, and the Nazi, the part, party chancellery, for example. So what do they have in common, we are these 15 men? They're, they're pretty young. On average, they are 42 years old. Um, and if we take Reinhard Heydrich, for example, who we see here, Heydrich is 37 years old at the time of the meeting. They, most of them, with the exception of two, come from middle-class families. We have 11 Protestants, three Catholics. We have nine Prussians, a majority, but people from Saxony, from Württemberg, from Bavaria, Austria, and one Ger Russian German from the city of Odessa. Half of them, almost seven, had fought in World War I, but eight belonged to the war youth generation that was too young to fight in World War I, but now in power uh, were heading towards a, a, a sort of their goal, winning this last war of, uh, of, of their parents' generation. 10 of the 15 men went to university. Eight of them had been awarded doctorates. Eight had studied law. Some were old fighters, joined the party already in the 20s. Some joined in the early 30s. And some only late in 1933 or even after the, uh, the, the ban to uh, join the party was lifted in 1937. Nine were also members of the SS. Some were members of the Reichstag and set even as we see with Wilhelm Kritzinger on the government bench. So we have an elite of well-educated young men, relatively young, well-educated and convinced of the Nazi ideology. But other than that, they're pretty average. They are ordinary Germans. A person we do not see here on this uh, graph is, is the secretary who was present. We know that a secretary was present who took notes. She was not of, seemed not to be of interest for a long time, and that has changed in the last year. Why? Well, if a secretary is present at a meeting like that, it seems that's a work meeting. It's a regular meeting. Somebody's taking notes, a stenographer, and she's, it, it seems for these men, it's a, it's a work meeting where they come, um, take notes, and at the end, they all get a protocol. And now a colleague did some research. The secretary was a young woman born in 1919, so she also is in her 20s, in her early 20s, uh, had worked in the office of Adolf Eichmann in the Reich Security Main Office, and he trusted her. She had worked, was the longest uh, working secretary for him, um, and she was a convinced uh, national socialist. So she took the notes, and according uh, accordance with her, and uh, the, the protocol um, was written by Adolf Eichmann. And Eichmann um, really is the one, the, the expert for Jewish affair in the office, Roman 4B4, in the Rice Security main office. He writes the protocol in coordination with um, uh, Reinhard Heidel. Now let's look at the protocol. And we have here already page five of the protocol. The first pages are filled with participants, a list of participants who was there. Heidrich gives an overview, but on page five, we see uh, this quote, as a further possible solution, and with the appropriate prior authorization by the Führer, emigration has now been replaced by evacuation of the Jews to the east. However, these operations should be regarded only as provisional options, though in view of the coming final solution of the Jewish question, they are already supplying practical experience of vital importance. Um, so from, from this quote, why, and, and this is typical for the protocol, can we say uh, what was, th that they talked about mass murder, deportations. And 
we can find out if we look at some other of the participants. We have here, for example, Dr. Rudolf Lange. And Lange is one of the commanders of a police battalion of the security police in Latvia. He's stationed in the city of Riga. And the day before that meeting at Wannsee, he is in Riga. And that day a train arrives with 1,000 Jews coming from Theresienstadt, the concentration camp in the uh, Czech, uh, in Czechoslovakia near Prague. Uh, with 1,000 Jews, uh, this train arrives in Riga. They are unloaded. They are brought to the woods, often had to dig their own graves, and were murdered, shot one after the other by the troops and under the command of Rudolf Lange. He comes to Berlin, participates in this meeting, and we have to be clear with bloody hands. And he is the, the practitioner of mass murder, and he gives evidence about the practical experience of vital importance, as they phrase it in the protocol. Other experiences that, that, that these murderers have are with the euthanasia killings already, how to murder in an orderly way with gas chambers. On page seven, the protocol continues. In the course of the final solution and other appropriate direction, the Jews are to be utilized for work in the East in a suitable manner. And large labor columns and separated by sex, Jews capable of working will be dispatched to these regions to build roads. And in the process, a large number of them will undoubtedly drop out by way of natural reduction. And it continues on page eight. Those who ultimately should possibly get by will have to be given suitable treatment because they unquestionably represent the most resistant segment and therefore constitute a natural elite that, if allowed to let go free, would turn into a germ cell of renewed Jewish revival and, in brackets, witness the experience of history. And again, we have to look at what is meant by, by all, the, uh, all of this. People will undoubtedly drop out by way of natural reduction. That means we work them to death. They, their workforce is exploited to the end. Uh, and we have so many slave laborers that uh, they can die. And that's the purpose of the work and the end. And that's parallel to the uh, program in the concentration camps in uh, Germany, extermination through labor. And those who survive this will have to be given suitable treatment. And there's only one way to read this, and that means they will be killed. They will be murdered, and we have practical experience with that. On page six of this protocol, we have a statistic. We have the statistics on how many Jews are estimated to live in January 1942 in the different European countries and regions. Category A, which we see here, shows the countries under German control. The Alt-Right, that's Germany, the Ostmark, Austria, and so on. And category B, that those are the countries where we have either to send out diplomats, as in the case of Bulgaria, and we do have the Foreign Office, for example, present at uh, this meeting here. And we have England, well, where we have to win the war. But the estimation is that there are over 11 million Jews in Europe. It's quite clear from the protocol uh, of the meeting, what these participants meant when they said final solution, the planned murder of 11 million Jews of Europe. And coming back to the three goals that Heydrich had, one, securing his leading role, two, asking for cooperation from the attending ministries and organization, and three, making everybody aware of what final solution meant. He had reached two of them, the three goals quite easily. His authority was backed by the letter of Göring, and he made everybody aware what final solution meant in case people were not aware. And that is highly unlikely. The third goal was a little more difficult, asking for cooperation for a program of mass murder. How it was phrased in the protocol uh, of the meeting was parallelisierung der Linienführung, parallelizing of the procedure. In order to have one procedure for the Europe-wide deportations to the death camps in occupied Eastern Europe, Heydrich needed cooperation. And that is the result of the Bamsi conference. Everybody was willing to cooperate. Nobody hesitated and looked for a way not to participate in the genocide. Nobody could have done that openly, but there are always ways to play the system. We are overworked, we are understaffed, it's not the right time. Nobody did that. They all looked at their field of work 
was not effective, but if it was not, they were all willing to cooperate. And if we'll have another look at the people who were here, we see on the left-hand side, Heidrich and his staff, Eichmann is there and Rudolf Lange is there. And then we have on in the middle, we have um, the ordinary ministries, the plenipotentiary for the four-year plan, Mr. Neumann. He is only involved once in the protocol, mentioned once when uh, he says, well, what about the Jewish slave laborers that I need for the war industry? And then Heidrich assures him, no, no, they, before they will not be replaced by other civilian slave laborers, they will not deport, be deported. Or Martin Luther from the foreign office, he comes with a known wish list of the foreign office of wishes and ideas how to participate. And for these men, bureaucratic language helped. Not once the protocol talks about gassing people, about mass shootings, about murder. Everything is described in different terms. But it is quite clear that murder was meant. There is no other way of reading the protocol. And also from post-war testimony, you can also assume that the participants were explicit in the way they talked about the final solution. So here at Wannsee, the murder of the European Jews was not decided. That is a misunderstanding often made until today but it was coordinated by leading bureaucrats how it was going to be implemented and carried out. The Europe-wide deportations were a central part of it. The perpetrators who gathered in Banzi joined their Nazi convictions rooted in racial anti-Semitism with a sober and objective understanding of their bureaucratic profession to create an effective plan for the genocide of the European Jews. The Banzi conference signifies the willingness of German state offices to cooperate in the Holocaust. The conference participants became accessories to and perpetrators of the genocide with several agencies and hundreds of thousands of civil servants and police participating in its execution. Now, the question is after 1945, what happened to these men that were responsible as sitting at the desk in the Holocaust? And if we look at this group of 15 men, the short answer what happened to them is nothing. Nobody was ever tried for participating in this meeting. Well, if we look carefully, we can divide them in three groups. One third, including Heydrich, died before the end of the war. Heydrich dies short a few days uh, after an assassination attack on his life by Czech partisans in June 1942. One third is tried for other crimes. Josef Bühler from the general government that part in, uh, which was the occupied part of Poland, uh, was handed over to Poland for the crimes he committed there, sentenced to death and executed. And the most known, of course, is Adolf Eichmann, who escaped to Argentina after the war, was kidnapped by the Israeli Secret Service, brought to Israel, tried in Jerusalem, sentenced to death and executed. But one third was never tried, were imprisoned only for a short time after the war and lived integrated into post war society in West Germany. And what we see here is the obituary of the last participant who died in early 1987. That was Gerhard Klopfer. His family had an obituary in the regional paper that they mourn the death of Mr. Klopfer, who died after a fulfilled life to the well-being for everybody under his influence. At that time in the mid 80s, it was known what the Banzer Conference was and that caused a scandal. And that shows us also how the dealing with this past, with this difficult past, with this criminal past um, changed in the decades after the war. And with that, I come to the second part um, of my uh, presentation. How do we deal with this uh, history today? And we, uh, for the 80th anniversary, we did an exhibition uh, on coming to terms with it, the meaning of the Banzer Conference today, which was shown um, at the German Bundestag in January, uh, 2022. And we have a few, you see a few impressions here. And we have a few guiding principles uh, that are important in our view to deal with this history today. And one is, if we look at the history, we have to look also how we dealt, this history was dealt with after 1945 by different groups. How it was denied for a long time, this history um, in, in the society of the perpetrators and how difficult it was for many people to face 
the reality of the crimes. The second is that we need a multitude of perspectives. Even if we focus on the perpetrators, uh, we do not only want to re reproduce the perspective of these perpetrators while talking about the Wannsee Conference or the time between 1933 and 45. One focus must be to consider the perspective of the victims. And ultimately, the meaning of the meeting at Wannsee can only be understood by reflecting on the perspective of Jews, men, women, and children. And it is important to look at different sources, especially from the victims, uh, personal documents, um, uh, but also personal documents, diaries from perpetrators. But, and, and look at them aside from documents and photographs and testimonies uh, from 1945 to understand the meaning. And I would like to give you a few examples. And I come back to Rudolf Lange, who you see here on the left. He's one of the killers uh, of the Einsatzgruppen, who was already in be months before the Wannsee Conference involved in the mass shootings of Jews in uh, Latvia. And we see a report from him from uh, December where he states 20, 27,800 Jews were executed in a major operation in Riga in early December 1941. And we see a survivor testimony here by Max Michelsen, who had lost his parents. Um, in these killings in Latvia in December 1941. Max Michelsen was a, a born in 1924. He was 18 years old. Um, he survived, but in his memories, he, he said, we were already dead before the Wannsee conference. So the killing had begun earlier. The murder did, was not decided at Wannsee because it was happening already. And Lange is one of the perpetrators. Max Michelsen's parents were both murdered. So the image of the Wannsee Conference as a meeting where the Holocaust was decided upon uh, can be questioned by discussing the events through different perspectives. And I think especially the survivors who, where we have reports and evidence what, what they experienced before the January 1942 are quite powerful statements in this context. And to add another component, I'd like to mention another man, Schlama Berwiner, a young Jewish man who was deported to the camp of Kulmhof in um, December 1941. Kulmhof Chelno was the first death camp which was uh, established with gas vans uh, near the city of Wuch and the ghetto of Litzmannstein. He was deported to Kulmhof in, uh, in December and then from or early January 1942. And he was assigned to the Jewish work detail that had to take the bodies of the Jews who had been murdered in the gas vans to a nearby forest and bury them in mass graves. On the 19th of January, the day that Rudolf Lange commanded the killing in Riga, Schlama Berwiner escaped from Kulmhof. He has made his way to Warsaw and gave a report about the mass killings. And his report is the first report that we have about a killing, the mass killing by gas of Jews by the Germans uh, in the camp of Kulmo. And Schlama Bevina was then taken to Zamosh to protect him. And a few weeks later, the Germans deported the Jews from Zamosh to the newly established uh, death camp of Belgets where he was murdered in April 1942 at the age of 30. So we have a culmination of events on this 19th of January. Um, and, and where Lange commands the murder, Schlama Bevina goes to Warsaw and he gives a report to Herr Schwasser. And Herr Schwasser is a, a member of the Oenig Shabbos, the Ringelblum archive. And, and this Ringelblum archive, of course, is important for us if we look at the sources of the victims about the killings. And we see Herr Schwasser here who survived the war. And next to him, we see Rachel Auerbach. And um, very clearly where we see the importance of, um, of, of giving evidence <coughs> um, to the, about, the, um, uh, about the events. All Jews should know 
whether they wish to know it or not, every effort should be made to communicate the truth to the non-Jewish world too. That is the impetus that the, the survivors have, that Rachel Auerbach has in being a member of, of, of those Jews that says our history might be over as people, as communities, uh, we all will be murdered, but our history has to be, our stories have to be told. We must know we need to face the facts. And Auerbach's approach of writing our history, the history of the Jews of Europe, written by Jews themselves, is relevant for us. Whose history is it? And who writes history? From which perspective is history written? And what we cl can clearly say is that on the side of the perpetrators or the side of German society after 1945, there was a clear unwillingness to confront this history and to write this history in a self-critical way. But um, we have also a, a, a connection being made to the House of the Wanzer Conference. In the back here, we see Josef Wolf, a survivor himself. And he tried to establish a documentation center about the Nazi uh, past and the crimes at the House of the Wanzer Conference in the 60s. Uh, he wanted to establish an international documentation center about national socialism and its consequences. We have to talk about how this history continued to influence our lives today. He fails, but eventually, uh, 1992, the House of the Wanzer Conference uh, was opened and our library is named after him. Um, and for him, and you see here a quote of one of his, his friends who worked with him, um, the, writing this, the history uh, of the Holocaust was his life theme. And you see here that he didn't see the history of the Nazi past as Jewish history. You're coming with a Jewish point of view again. Um, that, that means nothing at all. Look, national socialism, not a Jewishism. National socialism is a German issue. Um, so I think he, by this, he hoped also that Germany was willing to take on that task and confront itself with this history. And I hope that at the time when he lived, he was bitterly disappointed. So in rethinking the Wanze Conference, it's important for us to connect the historic events of the history of the Holocaust with the post-war history and our societies today. We can make connections from participants of the Wanze Conference to the victims and survivors, to their testimonies as essential parts of writing this history and to the dynamics in post-war Germany in coming to terms with this history, uh, which for a very long time remained involuntary remembrance. And to make this connection with sources from various perspectives and with a broad variety of sources that enables us to deal with this history as a dense narrative that shows us that this part of history is still relevant 80 years later. And if we look again at this world today, we see, I think, that coming to terms with traumatic pasts um, is by far over. I think we need to address this. And whenever we thought we have dealt with it, we, we have uh, established a consensus on uh, never again, I think we see that all our um, certainties are crumbling in the world and things are happening in the world that we uh, held, couldn't imagine a few years ago. And so in, in dealing with our present today, I think uh, that dealing with this history can be very helpful and can enable us, hopefully, to learn from this chapter of history. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Haas, for your most educational and inspiring perspective. I know I speak for our audience in appreciation of your shared knowledge. We gather here virtually to mourn the six million Jewish victims of the Holocaust. We are so grateful for the survivors among us who continue to teach us about strength of spirit, faith, and perseverance. Against all odds, they survived. With this candle, we remember those who perished and we honor those who survived.
My name is Emily Goodman, and I am the director of Holocaust and Countering Anti-Semitism Programming for the Baltimore Jewish Council, and I also run the Holocaust Survivors Speakers Bureau. Starting this position within the middle of a pandemic has limited my ability to interact in person with the dedicated survivors who volunteer their time to share their personal Holocaust experiences with students and community groups across the region. I never had the privilege of meeting Edith Cord in person, but I did have the honor of calling her a friend. The first time I spoke to Edith was after I reached out to arrange a virtual speaking engagement for her to give her Holocaust testimony to a group of students. Edith had been personally requested by the teacher who remembered her from numerous years before, who wanted her back in their classroom. I came to find that this was a common theme with Edith. She left a mark on everyone she encountered even if that meeting was a 45 minute window of time where she told the incredible story of her Holocaust survival. During that first phone call I had with Edith, I knew she was going to make a difference in my life. We spoke for a while. She told me about her life, her journey of survival, her move to the United States, and the challenges that came with it. And she loved her children and her grandchildren. She spoke with such enthusiasm, passion, and energy, I would have never known she was in her 90s by the way she spoke. Edith was someone who never seemed to slow down. Even in the midst of a pandemic, she told me that she would never turn down an opportunity to speak with students, which made sense considering one of her many past careers included teaching. She was so passionate about Holocaust education and fighting anti-Semitism that it was something she did with vigor up until her passing. Edith accomplished so much in her 93 years and created a magnificent legacy. She was a French and German professor, an insurance broker, financial planner, wife, mother, grandmother, author of two books, and a public speaker. But most importantly, she was a friend to all. I cherish each and every phone call I was able to have with Edith in the short amount of time I was fortunate enough to know her. I looked forward to hearing her voice, to hear about the things that she was still managing to do in quarantine, and miss speaking about the day we'd finally meet in person. It's funny to think how someone you've only seen through a screen can touch your heart in such a powerful way. Edith. I thank you for being such a welcoming friend and for the countless hours you've dedicated to educating thousands and thousands of students. You left this world better than you found it. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk about my mother and her contributions and how they have influenced me in my life. Soon after my mother died, several of her doctors called to express their condolences one of them noted that a visit from my mother was always an event, complete with a Wall Street Journal clipping, a conversation on finance, and of course, some life advice. So it goes with no surprise that being Edith's daughter was a lifelong event and that she had a huge influence and deep role in shaping who I am, teaching me several lessons that I'd like to share with you today. One of her biggest gifts to us was a strong sense of social justice that she and my father so effectively imparted to all of us. My early memories are shaped by my parents' engagement in civil rights and politics. My mother crying in front of the TV over after the death of Kennedy and what that meant to our country. My, her efforts to desegregate the community pool, the march my parents organized downtown to protest the Mississippi civil rights murders in 1964, and my mother's leadership in starting an after-school study program for disadvantaged children in our town. Having survived the Holocaust, she was deeply committed to building a world that was better because she had lived, a goal she clearly achieved. And these experiences profoundly influenced who I am today and what I do and my work in international development. Perhaps the biggest lessons came from the last years of her life though where she emphasized the importance of growing towards the light and focusing on what you want to see materialize 
and seeing the good in people to attract even more goodness and taking a childlike joy from every moment and every detail, from the beauty of her orchids to the accomplishments of her grandchildren, accepting them for totally for who they were and not trying to change them. She faced adversity of her illness with grace and a firm positive attitude that allowed her to have fun and enjoy life until practically the end. These years were also marked with deep meaning for her as she did so much public speaking around her experiences to churches, to government officials, to, and particularly to school children that she loved to engage with, reflecting her academic past perhaps and her ability to connect with young people. It is with great pleasure and honor that I have to be with you today through video, but thank you so much for honoring my mother and her accomplishments. As Director of Holocaust Programs at the Baltimore Jewish Council, I had the privilege of driving Holocaust survivors to speaking engagements, among them, of course, Bertha Schwartz. Accompanying Bertha to speaking engagements was always a joy, with lively and interesting conversation as we traveled in the car. However, watching Bertha address the students and watching the students react to Bertha was the treat. She easily bonded with the students regardless of their ages. Her audiences were always respectful and attentive listening to her story. As with many Holocaust speakers, at the end of the presentation, there was always a crowd of students seeking a private word and or a photo with her. Bertha and the students would be beaming with happiness and satisfaction when they were photographed. However, the most poignant memory of Bertha and students occurred at Francis Scott Key Elementary Middle School on Fort Avenue. Returning to the car, Bertha told me about a 12 or 13 year old girl, one among many students who had gathered around her for a private word. The girl told Bertha, I wish you were my grandmother. After which Bertha and the girl exchanged hugs. I feel this young girl articulated what many students felt being with Bertha. Bertha, your unique sweetness and thoughtfulness will be missed. Your memory is a blessing. Very recently, we lost another member of our Holocaust Survivors Speakers Bureau family, Rachel Bodner. For many years, Rachel volunteered her time to share her personal Holocaust experiences with thousands of students, community groups, and other organizations, and undoubtedly shared a story that would stay with her audiences forever. She worked closely with students at Galkshir College who would interview her, record her story, and then learn to share her story with others. Now, her story will live on through those students she influenced. She was a gracious woman and played an integral part in seeing that one of the nuns who helped her survive the Holocaust was recognized at Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations. Her dedication to educating students about the Holocaust was exceptional. Rachel, thank you for inspiring us all. May your memory be for a blessing. Rachel served as co-chair of the Holocaust Remembrance Commission from 2017 until her death earlier this year. My name is Margie Simon, and I was privileged to work with Rachel as co-chair for four of those six years. She was a marvel. As a Jewish educator, she had both a great deal of knowledge about the Holocaust and the pedagogical understanding of how to best present the content. She also had the skills of a director-producer. She saw the whole picture and knew how she wanted the pieces of the program to go together to achieve the desired outcome. Programs should be interactive, should touch the head and the heart, and should always leave the participant with something to take away. Despite how much Rachel knew, she always wanted to learn more. We usually ran right up to the deadline because Rachel wanted to find one more piece of information, one more image. Rachel raised the bar for Kristallnacht and Yom HaShoah programming. We will strive to live up to her high standards. Working with Rachel was also fun. Though we knew each other prior to becoming co-chairs, over the four years we worked together, we became good friends. That being said, one of the things that made Rachel so special is that anyone who knew her considered her a friend. 
when she spoke to you, you felt you were the most important individual in the room. She was that kind of person, warm, caring, generous, and thoughtful. Rachel's energy level was legendary, as was her devotion to Jewish education, both formal and informal. She was the education director of Beth Israel's religious school for 26 years and the director of Habanim Jor Kat Mosheva for 28 years. In retirement, she taught at Chizkamuna's Rosenblum Religious School, led a weekly lunch and learn at Beth Israel, and was part of the selection committee for the Weinberg Family Baltimore Jewish Film Festival, among other activities. Holocaust education, however, was especially close to her heart. Born in Patras, Greece in 1948, she felt deeply her responsibility as second generation to share the story of how her family survived the war. Rachel's great nephew, Dr. Joshua Fishbein, composed a cantata entitled Out of the Ashes of the Holocaust, which had a virtual premiere last year by the Washington Master Chorale. Rachel was so proud. The words of the cantata are based on testimony of the family's story that was introduced by then Representative Barbara Mikulski into the 1984 congressional record. Representative Mikulski referenced remarks that Robert F. Kennedy made in 1966 address in Cape Town, South Africa. Each time we stand up for an ideal or act to improve the lot of others or strike out against injustice, we send forth a tiny ripple of hope. Rachel lived these words. In her memory, we will now hear a tiny ripple of hope, the last movement of the cantata.
שוכן במרומים. אמצי מנוחה נכונה תחת כנפי השכינה ומלאות קדושים וטהורים כזוהר הרקיע מזכירים את נשמות כל אחינו בני ישראל אנשים נשים וטף שנטבחו ושנחנקו ושנשרפו ושנהרגו בגן עדן תהי מנוחתם נבל הרחמים, הסתירם בסתר כנפיך לעולמים, וצרור ביזרור, החיים את נשמותיהם, אדוני הונחלתם. וינוחו בשלום על משכבותיהם. ונאמר אמן. יתגדל ויתגדש שמי רבה. ועלמה דברק הירותי וימליך מלכותי. בחייכון וביומכון ובחיי דכל בית ישראל. בעגלה ובזמן קריב ואמרו אמן. יהי שמי רבה מברך לעולם עולמי עולמיה. יתברך וישתבח ויתפאר ויתרומם ויתנשא. ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתהלל שמי דקודשא בריכו. לאלה מכל ברכתה ושירתה. תוש בכתה ונחמתה דמירן בעלמה ואמרו אמן. יהי שלמה רבה מן שמיה וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן. עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל. Thank you to everyone who worked to make this virtual event a success. Special thanks to Senator Ben Cardin, Chitzakamuna Congregation, Rabbi Joshua Gruenberg, Cantor Randy Herman, Dr. Joshua Fishbein, Rabbi Andrew Bush, and Emily Goodman of the BJC, and the BJC's entire Holocaust Remembrance Commission for their dedication in bringing this program to life. Please note this presentation will remain available on the Baltimore Jewish Council's website. We ask that you share this program with others who may not have internet access. Thank you to all for your continuing support and commitment to Holocaust remembrance. To conclude our program, please rise and join in the singing of Hatikah.